Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is first response mental health strategies for crisis intervention. So we've been looking forward to this event since we started planning it almost, um, I guess it was at the end of late, late last year, but not only because two of our favorite speakers are here that are presenting with us today, but also we're kicking off a full quarter of workplace mental health topics. And so today we're starting it with one of the most critical components, which is teaching you the fundamentals of mental health first aid. So those are going to be the steps and then also um, some of these strategies that you can use in those intervention types of situations. So we do have some real world scenarios to take you through so that you understand not only what those specific mental health steps are, but also how it is that you can apply those in um, situations within your workplace. We're looking forward to all of your questions, all of your stories and really being interactive. So in case we haven't met, my name is Holly Foxworth. I'm a registered nurse and I am the marketing manager for content here at Axia. And before we get started, let's get you acquainted to what you're looking at here on your webinar screen. So on the right hand side of your screen, you're going to see a large blue box. And so that is the second event in our three part mental health series. That one focuses on depression and then also um, some of the suicide and things like that that we'll be going through. So the topic, uh, the title of that is Breaking the Silence, Tools for Combating Workplace Despair and Suicide. So Dr. Les Carte is going to be back with us. I believe that will be in about three weeks that we'll be back. It'll be on May 9th at 1 o'clock p.m. And so he's going to lead us through that one as well. And I think that we're also going to have our Director of Behavioral Health, uh, Sarah um, Hathaway, that's going to be joining us for that one too. So you definitely don't want to miss that. Again, the way that you get registered for that is just clicking on that blue RSVP button. You don't have to enter any additional information. There's no names that you need to put in. Just click that button and that will get you registered for that event. You'll get that confirmation and we'll send it your way. So just some housekeeping items here to talk through. As always, we will be recording this event and then we make it available to you usually within like 24 hours after we get done today. There is a copy of today's slide deck. It's located there at the bottom of your screen. Um, you'll also see that there's also some great resources that are there. We've got some, um, some additional uh, case studies. We've got some surveys. There's various things that are down there. So you're welcome to check out any of those additional resources. Um, in addition to that, we do have, um, let's see, one additional box that I want you to really focus on, and that is what we call the Q&A box. And so that is one of the first places that we go whenever um, I look to send out gifts for today's event and really kind of follow up um, on another level with some of our attendees. So I look for great questions. I look for interaction, any kind of stories that you guys want to put in there um, as we're going through some of these scenarios and talking through some of the symptoms that you might see. Um, if you've seen those in your workplace, send us a note because we'll even share that with some of the other attendees and it really helps in the others. So put those there in the Q&A box. We definitely want to see those. We read everything that comes in. Um, one other way that you can interact with us is to utilize the emojis that are there at the bottom of your screen. So if there's a um, something that we say and say that Dr. Les is, is going through with some of the scenarios there with you, or maybe he's talking through some of the steps of mental health first aid and something really resonates with you, click that emoji button, click the heart button, and that that will save a clip of that so that we know that not only was it important to you, it probably is important to your colleagues as well so that we can share those with others. So those are two great ways of, of um, um, methods that you can communicate with us and kind of give us some feedback um, or submit any of those questions that you may have. So with that being said, let's go ahead and meet some of our attendees. How about we, let's see, let's bring up our speakers. Dr. Les, we'll start with you first, and then um, TJ will come to you second. Dr. Les, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thanks, Holly. It's great to be back. Um, I am Dr. Les Curte, Senior VP for Behavioral Health for Axiom Medical. Um, I have been in and around mental health for more than 50 years in one form or fashion. And uh, I spent the last 25 years really focused on workplace mental health. So this is an area of passion of mine and been involved with Axiom Medical for two years. So I'm really pleased to be here. Fantastic. And you do such a good job of this. And, um, you know, your, your voice is just so calming. You just always have so much wisdom <laughs> that you share with us. And we're so grateful for that. Yeah. TJ, how about you? Hey, uh, thank you, Holly, and uh, it is a pleasure to work with Dr. Tay. I've learned a lot from him the past couple of years we've worked together, so uh, he's, a, he's a good man, and um, just enjoy 
living with him and working with him and everything he's doing for the company and for our customers. Uh, my name is TJ Marino. I'm a, uh, the director of operational support for Axiom Medical. I've been with the company for about three and a half years now. Uh, I'm a semi-retired uh, senior army medic out of the army. Um, and uh, I've got some experience dealing with uh, some of the things we're gonna discuss today just through my, uh, my time in the military. As you can imagine, about 60% of the military um, servicemen and women, um, you know, fail to seek uh, help for or support for mental health issues. And, and um, I'd love to get some input on that. On top of that, I've been through Dr. Curte's uh, mental health first aid class as well. And uh, it's give, given me some great insight and some additional tools to put in my toolbox. So thanks for having me. That's fantastic. TJ, you've been on the webinar before, correct? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I don't know if it was this one. It was, I think I, I was on the active shooter uh, webinar we did. Um, it was, that is that is the one, yeah. And speaking of mental health, there were some publications. You were included in some of the publications as well. There was an article that was written about you, correct? Uh, yes, ma'am, that is correct. Yeah. So anyway, such stars that we have on today. So we appreciate both of you being here. We're going to have a great discussion. Um, so kind of to let's walk through some of the things that we're going to talk through today. So the first thing that we're going to do is kind of give you one of those scenarios that we're going to present you with. So that is on the edge, a crisis unfolding. So we're going to give you a scenario. We want you to kind of remember that. Then we're going to talk through understanding mental health in the workplace. So we're going to be going through some of those conditions that you may be seeing within your particular workplace. I think that some of you may, this may make a lot of sense to um, some of you that are there. You may be seeing on a daily basis, may not be something that you see um, see with all of your employees, but there definitely will be some that that, that may be experienced in some of these. Um, next, we'll get into recognizing the signs of mental health crisis. And so um, TJ is going to walk us through that, and we're going to be talking through some of those signs that, that you would want to be able to recognize early on. Then we'll take you through the principles of mental health first aid, um, go through all of those individual steps, and then we're going to bring that back to the scenario again. And and talk through how it was, how it is that you would manage that within your particular workplace. So TJ, I will come to you first and I'm gonna let you kind of talk through and give us our scenario and get us set up for what we're gonna be going through. All right, let's go. Um, so this is um, a Larry, this is the character we're gonna use throughout the discussion today. Um, I ask that you, you remember this story and, and, and some of the key points that, um, that we're gonna bring up with Larry um, uh, during our, our uh, our discussion over mental health. Um, Larry's a machine operator. Um, he's been in the manufacturing industry. He's got a wealth of experience, 32 year old male, um, not only just seven years of employment at the plant, but seven years of rewarding uh, employment at the plant. Um, wants a model of punctuality, precision, um, and I'm gonna add some other key factors in there too. Not only was a model of punctuality and precision, but he's also a champion of uh, workplace safety culture um, and he, he did a lot of mentoring for uh, new uh, new employees that were being onboarded. So he, he's been there to help others, you know, be successful in their careers. He's been there for, for quite a few folks. Um, but lately, he's, he's had some issues with uh, not showing up to work on time or not showing up to work at all. Um, other employees are starting to, to kind of see what, um, like, see what he's doing and and they're starting to uh, to whisper in the company, like you know, hey, maybe there's something going on, or you know, uh, Larry, you know, is just acting out of uh, out of character for the most part. Um, when he's talking to his coworkers, he, he doesn't seem interested in any of their conversations. He's very distant, and even on his way out the door, you know, he, he doesn't really want to make eye contact with folks, and he's just kind of rushing to get out the door and and uh, and get away from the job site. Um, and on occasions, his supervisors notice some, some uh, trembling in the hands and some other physical features that are, are kind of, um, uh, you know, pointing towards a, a more, um, I guess, severe crisis that might be going on. Um, during this call, I, I ask that, you know, if you do have stories or, or anything else that you'd like to share or personal experiences, I see one that kind of popped up in the box already from uh, mm -hmm. from hope I'm saying this right, Shauna, about one of her experiences. Um, you know, if, if you do have similar stories, you know, feel free to share those with, with folks without using actual names and things like that. But, um, you know, this is a collaborative effort that we're doing today and, and we just want uh, everybody to be involved, so. 
Awesome, TJ. Well, thank you for that. And Dr. Les, before we before we get into to you talking through some of this, I did want to share what Shauna said. It made so much sense. She said, um, I knew that I had to do more to feel prepared for mental health situations when I was told by an employee, a brand new employee um, that was in the back of the building in a fetal position, crying and saying that they only wanted to talk to me. I didn't know the person or the pressures um, that they were facing. Let's see, being the only person that they'd speak to made me realize that I needed to be more prepared prepared. Um, and she talked about the so, so is prey, didn't want to say the wrong thing, um, and has since then gotten a, a first aid mental health mental health first aid certificate, but always wants to do more. Um, and so anyways, that was a great story that that she had shared. Yeah, we appreciate you doing that. And if anybody else has any other great stories as well, any other scenarios that you're facing, please feel free to put those in the chat because this is exactly this type of uh, conversations that, that we're here to have today. Dr. Dr. Les, go ahead and talk us through um, the mental health workplace and, and some of the conditions that we may be seeing there. Yeah, I, I, can, I, can I just do a quick response to, yes, to that absolutely. story in the box? Just because um, what, what she said at the end was, you know, I wanna know what to do mm -hmm. and, and, and I think it's important to recognize that when we are dealing with someone who seems to be having trouble and, or, you know, we're confronted with that, there is not, I, I told you, I, had, I, I, I have over 50 years of experience in some form or fashion in the mental health field. There's not a time that I don't have that initial response of, oh boy, I hope I know what to do now. Right. I mean, that just comes with the territory of making yourself open to people and address and addressing them. And that's all right. That's because because human contact is what's needed, not not perfection. Um, you know, I, I have a friend who knows a lot about crisis intervention specifically. And, you know, and he once said to me, you know, if you if your neighbor's husband just died suddenly, you know, what would you do for her? You know, well, you take take her a casserole or, you know, you see if there's anything you can do. And he said, when somebody's in crisis, do that, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> just yeah. do the human thing. So anyway, I, I, I think that's a great preface to what we're gonna talk about is that's really important is, it is somewhat anxiety provoking. It's one of the reasons that we don't do enough. Mm -hmm. um, but but often what we need to do is just human contact. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Um, yeah. uh, uh, go ahead, TJ. I was gonna say, no, you're absolutely right. And um, and Sean, I don't think, uh, I, I think you did the absolutely, you know, best thing you could do and that's just be present, you know, yeah. The, you know, the act of listening and just um, when, when folks are in crisis, sometimes they just want somebody to hear them. You know, I, I think there's that old video of the nail in the head, you know, where um, the wife has a nail in her head and, and the guy is, keeps telling her, you've got a nail in your head and, and she just wants him to listen so she can vent, you know, or, you know, just be there. And, and he he listens and, and it, you know, and then, you know, it, that, that's I, I guess that's that's my way of looking at it, you know from a different perspective, but I don't think there was anything that you, um, you know, as far as like just being present, I mean, that's that's all we can do sometimes um, until we can escalate to somebody, you know, with the, the right credentials or, or you know, uh, get them to the right place, just keeping them safe and, and keeping them from doing harm to themselves or somebody around them. And sometimes that's just talking to them or going for a walk with them or whatever it may be. Absolutely. Dr. Carte, we had another one that had came in. Jerry was talking about um, now that I have a mental health first aid certificate, people have been coming to me so very often. She said one person was on the verge of ending their life in the office. I spoke with her and even took her to a first therapy appointment. They found out that her meds were not working. Um, and that is why, um, let's see, her meds were not working is because she was on treatment that was resistant to depression. Now they found a solution. She's so happy and thriving there in the office. Isn't that an amazing story? It's a, it's a great story. Uh, I mean, it. yeah, this is great. I mean, people are yeah. doing the presentation for us. This is like, <laughs> <Tell> you know, <laughs> <laughs> let's just take a break. Uh, 
you know yes uh, yes that's that's wonderful that's a that is a great story and um you know and yeah let, let's talk a little bit about you know some of this for for other folks who maybe are more hesitant or don't have those stories yeah. you know i i think that i actually um, asked to reorder the bullets on this on this slide to start with stress because I think one of the things that we don't recognize is that mental health really happens on a spectrum. And, you know, I often do this in live presentations when I can see the audience, you know, raise your hand if you haven't been stressed lately. <laughs> Astonishingly, you know, nobody raises their hand or one person who's the class clown raises their hand and they know they're lying. Um, so, I think we have a spectrum here, and it's not always about a true mental health crisis where someone is severely depressed and suicidal. That might happen. Mm -hmm. That you know that might be happening. But sometimes it's just people don't feel well. I could ask the same question about anxiety. You know, how many of us have never been anxious? Those are these are common human experiences that can escalate into into a problem. And part of what we're trying to do is to help employers and coworkers really step in early in the process before it becomes a mental health crisis when we're dealing with, um, you know, we're, we're dealing with potentially difficult situations, but we're not, it, it hasn't blown up yet, right? That's the idea. But all of these things can be, well, with the possible exception of schizophrenia, all of the things on this list are happening in every workplace, right? That, and, and it's not that people, that these stop people from working necessarily, you know, maybe it interferes temporarily, but a lot of us, you know, um, just statistically speaking, 8% of the people on this call warrant a diagnosis of major depressive disorder in, um, in any given year. And most of us take our antidepressant and come to work in the morning. Um, so I think part of this is understanding that there's a range of symptoms that we're talking about, that it does impact people and that all of this is happening all, all around us. And what we're encouraging folks to do is to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to go through some of the, the individual ones and, and what some of these are, Dr. Sure. Dr. Sure. So, you know, anxiety, anxiety is a common response, but, um, you know, it can escalate to a place where it really gets us frozen. Uh, generalized anxiety is probably the most common form of anxiety where we're just, we're, and it's characterized by worrying about everything, um, you know, to, to an extent that gets in the way of our function. That's a diagnosable disorder that can benefit from treatment. Um, de depre major depressive disorders are kind of the, um, the second most common diagnosable condition. Again, all of us have days when we feel a little blue. We're not really up to getting up today. We're not very motivated. We don't feel like ourselves. A major depressive disorder um, that's in an acute episode is way past that. This isn't just a bad day, right? This is somebody who's really struggling to get to function appropriately in life, and that's going to impact work. Um, but again, the diagnosis happens. It's when it's when we're in crisis, it's when the, the symptoms are acute that it interferes with function. It's, you know, having a depressive disorder by itself doesn't create, for example, that doesn't correlate very well with safety incidents in a, in a workplace an untreated or critical depressive disorder does, right? 
So that's why we want to recognize it. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder, most people are familiar with the idea of it. You know, it, it's a it's an extreme response to having witnessed or been confronted with a life-threatening or integrity-threatening situation. You know, we see a coworker die or, you know, we're threatened in some significant way. We're in a terrible car accident. Um, I think it's worth saying here that um, most of us experience traumatic events and we get shaken up and then get and then recover. Most of us don't actually get PTSD from trauma, from traumatic events. But when it happens, it can really interfere with function in le until it's addressed, right? Um, uh, flashbacks happen, people re-experience things. Um, so it, it, it's important to, again, make that distinction that it isn't it being exposed to trauma that's the issue. The issue is, is this are we having a reaction to it that's interfering with our day-to-day -day functioning? Um, substance use, yeah, you know, um, substance use is common, and it's it happens all around us. Um, and it, it, we can also be dealing with someone with, with problems with attention. You know, someone who just has trouble concentrating. That will get worse if we're stressed. Um, you know, I mean, you know, you know yourself when you're stressed or you're anxious about something, you're not really all all there present and paying attention to what you need to be doing. Um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder and schizophrenia are more severe uh, disorders that are less common, but can really interfere significantly with function. Again, treatable conditions that respond well to treatment. Um, but um, but certainly less common in the workplace. Thank I think you. we're all afraid, by the way, that you know we're going to be conf that if we see someone who's distressed, we're going to be um, confronted with someone who you know is having a break with reality. I think we're we're all terrified of that image. Um, that's the least common thing that happens. Hmm. Um, Dr. Dr. Kurt Tate, Ms. Clausen had asked, was asking about bipolar disorder and again, you know, how that could that can fit in in extreme crisis situations. Well, I think uh, there too. I, I mean, bipolar disorder is characterized by by a manic episode, so someone who is very overactive. Um, typically is engaged in what we say about it is it's engaged in extreme goal oriented behavior. Hmm. So, you know, I'll put that in, I'll put that in context for you. I had a patient who spent over a hundred thousand dollars that he didn't have in a 36 hour period without buying a house or a car. Wow. That's, I mean, think about how hard you got to work to spend that much money in 36 hours without buying something that big. Right? Yeah. Um, wow. I mean, it's it's huge. Um, that's in a florid manic episode, right? Um, often, someone who's bipolar also has depressive episodes after, and those can be very severe, and actually have of all of the. And I, I should have caught this. We should have put it on the list, mm -hmm. um, honestly. Um, depressive, diso depressive episodes in bipolar disorder can be very severe and actually carry the highest risk of, of um, dying by suicide of all of the diagnoses. So it's very serious and requires treatment. Typically, mm -hmm. we'll respond well to medication in combination with some therapy to help with um, coping skills, uh, mm. but yeah, it definitely fits in. And shame sure. on me for not catching that. So I'm glad it, I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah, um, TJ, talk to us about some of the the early recognition signs um, that there may be some type of crisis that could be developing there before we get back into to some of the mental health first aid components. Sure. Um, so. No, I just want to kind of, before we go into these, um, Dr. Curtis said something that was pretty important 
on the last slide, and that was, uh, you know, just being aware um, yeah. of what's going on and being present. I think a big piece of, of um, you know, so I've, I've had the honor of like sitting in like different roles and leadership in the military and, and now in my civilian career and, and stuff like that. And, and I think, um, you know, whether that's direct or organizational, strategic, whatever it may be, um, I, I think understanding the, the people you work with um, and um, not only just understanding how they work and what they do for the organization, but who they are, um, you know, being present in their lives, you know, just as you would be present in your, in your kids' lives or your wife, um, or your wife, you know, I, I think that's a key piece to, to recognizing like any early signs of any of this stuff, you know, um, if, you know, if you don't know how somebody in your, your organization is performing or what their normal behavior looks like, then how are you going to recognize all of this stuff? And, and just bringing us back to like understanding each other as people is, is very important, you know, um, and not just, you know, as a company or a department, but on the individual level, you know, just, you know, who you're working with, like, what are their interests? Mm -hmm. you know? How often do you engage with them, you know, to, to discuss things outside of work, um, just to check in with them and see how they're doing, you know, that's a big piece of it. And that's something that I valued um, throughout my career is like my leadership coming, you know, coming down and saying, Hey, how are you today? You know, what's going on? Um, yeah. Tell me about your weekend. Tell me about your, your life, you know, um, just sharing some of that stuff, you know, you can kind of start to get a gauge of who that, that person is as an individual. And, and then it'll help you with some of your subtle, um, you know, rec like early recognition signs that we're about to go through, you know, like for instance, changes in performance um, or changes in behavior. Uh, you know, if you, if you notice people that are normally like extroverted, you know, and then all of a sudden, you know, they stick to themselves. They don't want to be around anybody. You invite, you know, you invite them to, you know, to a, a happy hour or something like that. And normally they they show up and all of a sudden they start, they stop participating and things like that. Or, you know, you jump on a team's call and where they're always on the camera, you know, now they're no longer on the camera, you know, what, what's going on with that? Or if they are on the camera, are they disheveled? They look like they just woke up, you know, you can tell if somebody's having a bad day, you know, if, if you can't tell somebody's having a bad day, then, you know, you're not paying attention. And, you know, I mean, you, you'll know, you know, um, emotional signs, you know, um, are there things that you talk about in your, you know, throughout your day that might, you know, cause them to, to change emotionally, you know, do you bring up a certain topic, you know, a good, you know, a good, uh, I guess, example, just from a personal experience, you know, my time in as a medic in the army, I was exposed to a lot of trauma in Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, one of the things I dealt with in, um, in both of those theaters was um, a lot of pediatric trauma, you know. Um, and I remember coming home and uh, with my kids and I, just one of my kids like bumped his head on the table or something and, you know, just lost it he was crying like he had cracked his head open and um i'm an army medic i've seen a lot of trauma you know i've, I've dealt with the stuff before and, and i couldn't handle that like it it caused me to become very emotional and i couldn't be around it and you know my wife couldn't understand what was going on and the kids are like what's going on with dad you know you know those things can kind of you know trigger a reaction sometimes and even your discussions can do that uh, we could talk a little bit about physical changes. Um, you know, how are they dressed for work? You know, they normally come in, you know, looking sharp and well-dressed, hair combed, and then all of a sudden they come in, they start coming in and, you know, they're wearing the same clothes they wore earlier in the week or they're, you know, disheveled looking. They, they you know, they, they just don't care about what they look like, you know. Um, Cognitive signs, you know, difficulty concentrating, memory problems, you know, if you told somebody to do something or you asked them to do something and, and it didn't get done, um, you follow up later and it still hasn't gotten done, you know, are they having trouble completing more than one task, you know, is it, are you giving them too much to do or is it it's just a common occurrence now where you, you gave them two or three tasks and they were able to complete it and all of a sudden they're, they're having, um, you know, some issues with, with completing their, their, uh, 
the tasks that you provided them. Those are all things that 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 are early signs that you can look at. And and even going back to Larry's, um, you know, we'll touch on it here just a little bit. But looking at Larry again, I mean, you know, somebody that was once, um, you know, like the pride of that department and was doing well and was successful for himself and making those around him successful. Then all of a sudden you know, everything just starts dropping off. You know, that's a key indicator right there that, hey, something's going on. We need to have a discussion and um, and, and kind of find out more. You know, you don't, you just got to get enough into, the, you know, deep down the layers enough where you get an understanding and kind of identify, you know, what it is that you can help with, you know. And, yeah. and like I said, I can't say this enough. This is something I'm, I'm big on, but just knowing who you're working with, being, you know, present in their lives, um, at work, you know, checking in with them, um, you know, and not just going about your routine day and, you know, checking the box. It's not a check the box thing. It's, you know, it's involvement. You got to be involved in this stuff. And, um, and like I said, that's really important to me. And it's always been important to me. And I, I try to take that with my family as well, you know, because sometimes I can get lost in that as well. You know, we get so busy, especially with kids and stuff. But sometimes I got to step back, rewind, and, you know, just be involved. Dr. Curte, do you have anything else you wanted to add to that? No, I, th I think you did great, TJ. I, d I don't. Um, these are all these are all really, really helpful. I think, you know, the, the theme that runs through them is, is there has there been a change? Yeah that you can't explain and that is impacting their ability to function. Mm -hmm. right? I mean, those are, those are important things. Um, you know, oddly enough, it's, it's the change that really matters. You know, if somebody is always two or three minutes late, I don't worry about them when they're three minutes late. Yeah. If somebody's always five minutes early and all of a sudden they start showing up late, I pay attention. You know, it doesn't, I mean, it could be anything. It could be they're taking a different path to work and they've, you know, they're going through a high traffic zone because they have to drop off their kids. Doesn't mean that it's a crisis, but paying attention to each other makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Um, TJ, just to speak to, to what you were mentioning about relationships, um, Timothy Reynolds had, had mentioned in here, said, in my field, I have a mantra that um, life is all about relationships, creating good relationships, creating good boundaries, and allowing others to grow in relationships. And he said, I've come to realize that it's not just about my field of work, it's all of life. I thought that was a great point to, to what you were saying about how important those relationships are. That, that that gave me goosebumps. That's yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It, it is, by the way. I mean, if you want to be technical about it, it is also the single best predictor of health, yeah. mental health, physical health, longevity. All of it is best predicted by social support, mm -hmm. the Absolutely. degree to which we have relationships, and you know that's demonstrated over and over again. I mean the the. You know, the the other way I've heard it put is nobody ends up on their deathbed wishing they'd spent more time in the office. Oh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's it's always about connections. You know, when yeah. I've changed jobs, when I've gone to new places, um, it's always the people I miss. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I just I think that's such an important point. Mm-hmm. Uh, and also, you know, just to add a, one more thing, I think, um, you know, recognizing um, signs early and often, um, it, it's crucial for, you know, like timely support and intervention with whatever it is that that person may be dealing with. Um, and not only does it, you know, help with with their road to, to, to recovery or getting better, but it also helps uh, in a more holistic sense with uh, the workplace in general. I mean, it just contributes to a healthier workplace. Um, you know, folks, when they see that, like people that care, they want to be, um, they want to be around those people. You know, it's it's just yeah. a, a natural to to you know, it's 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 a human quality. I mean, you want to be around people that care, um, 
and that want to make you successful as well. You know, and if if you're present in people's lives and you're, you know, other folks around, like people are always watching, you know, like my kid, like my kids are always watching me. I'm always watching other people just to kind of, you know, I mean, cause it helps with growth, you know, and, and, um, and your relationships. Um, but I think that when, when other folks see that, like that you truly care about the well being of somebody, um, you know, that makes them more comfortable in approaching you with, um, discussing, you know, having some of these difficult discussions or, or even um, approaching you if they see something, you know, like, hey, I know this person really well and they don't seem, you know, they, they, they seem off, but I, I haven't been able to connect with them, you know, um, would you mind talking with them, you know, or, or helping me out or something, you know, it's, it's a team effort. It's not just, you know, me or Dr. Perte or Holly or anybody else. It's all of us come together to, to make a difference and not just, uh, you know, not having it just fall on your lap. I mean, that's, that's very important. Absolutely. Yeah. TJ Tasha was saying, uh, Zimmerman was saying, thank you for sharing your personal story. Firsthand accounts are often the best takeaways in training. So we appreciate you sharing those things. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Dr. Tarte, let's talk about mental health first aid. Okay. One of my favorite topics. Yeah. And we've we've seen in the comments that there are several people who have taken this training. Yeah. I, I first encountered mental health first aid um, back in 2008, I think, at a conference. And that was just shortly after it came to the U.S. from uh, originally from Australia is where it was developed. Um, it's a training. It's a very specific training that's really intended to give people to help people have the tools to know how to respond and be less frightened about asking you know i my like we're all used to saying you know how you doing and the answer is always fine <laughs> um, <laughs> and the moment that it isn't it's like well you know what i'm not doing so good um it, we have that moment of panic right I think mm -hmm. mental health first aid is a wonderful training for helping diminish that sense of panic. It gives you some tools and it gives you a model to be, to be able to talk to people. And we're gonna talk about that model a little bit. Um, I've always been really, really impressed with mental health first aid and what the organ is, what the, um, um, oh my gosh, the, uh, I'll think of it in just one second because, it, but it just fell out of my head, the organization um, that you can, you can check this out about. I, I got so impressed with it that I eventually became a trainer for it. And he's an amazing trainer, I'll add. He did our mental health first aid training here internally, and it was one of the, the most significant uh, trainings that I've ever attended. It, it impacted my life, and it's something that we can utilize on a daily basis, even within our workplaces. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Um, Dr. Corte, was there anything else that you wanted to add about mental health first aid training? Are you ready to go on and talk about the no, steps? No, I think we can. I think we can talk about the the steps. Um, okay. And you know, this is this is the model that mental health first aid is built around. You know, it's the ALG model, A L G E E, um, and it just it it's not a linear sequence. People get tired of hearing me saying that in training. You know, those of you who have done the training with other people, they've probably heard this over and over again. This is not a linear sequence that you have to go through. It's not a it's not a prescription, but it's a way to think about, okay, so what's next? Um, you know, the A in this model stands for two things. One is approach and the other is assess. Right? You're always assessing for the potential for suicidal thoughts, for real, for real danger. I like to put the approach first because you don't find out anything if you don't approach people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's we have a huge problem with stigma, with mental health stigma in, in this in this country, really in Western cultures in general. Um, and maybe not limited to the West. Um, but, so we don't tend to say, and frankly, when I don't feel well, I don't really wanna talk. 
I don't really want to let everybody know that necessarily. Mm-hmm. So if, you know, um, that approach that, you know, I, uh, this, the other thing that people who went through the mental health first aid training with me uh, probably get tired of hearing me say is four most important words that I know are, how are you doing? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, that simple question asked in a way that implies that you actually are interested in the answer, by the way, um, uh, which is different than how you doing. Um, I think that's really important. So, but also I'm always assessing, you know, is there, is there anything here that's a true crisis that's a danger to that person or to other people? Mm-hmm. Um, which could be a, it, it could be a substance use crisis. Someone may be um, potentially overdosing. It could be that someone is really on the verge of dying, of wanting to die by suicide. Um, and, and that's followed by, you know, the, I, I say it's not linear, but these two things kind of happen all the time right away at the beginning. I mean, the, the first thing is to ask and be assessing. And the second thing is listen non judgmentally to the answer, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, what do you want when you go to see your doctor and you have a complaint? Most people answer that question with, I want to be heard. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's, that's the piece that is often rare. Um, and then the other steps kind of are variable depending on what's going on, right? I'm, I'm trying to, you know, giving reassurance and information is really about helping to calm the distress. Um, so, you know, I wanna reassure that person that I'm here. I don't wanna make false reassurances. I don't wanna say you're gonna be fine. First of all, people who are actually working on a mental health challenge, and especially if they're close to crisis, they're not gonna believe me when I tell them that they're gonna be fine. Mm -hmm. So don't lie to people. But also, I don't know what's gonna happen next. But what I can say is, I'm here, I'm listening, I'm gonna try and help you any way that I can. And, you know, if I have information that might be useful, like, you know, I know that there's been an incident in the workplace, you know, you just had a fight with a coworker, right? Well, one of the things that I know is that getting in arguments is upsetting. Mm -hmm. You know, first off, recognize that you you are having a a reaction that is understandable. Um, um, and, And then, depending on what's going on, if somebody's in a true crisis, they really need mental health support. I'm gonna encourage them to get professional help. Um, But also people may have strategies that they have to help themselves when they're they're having this experience. Um, And so, you know, what, what what do you do? That's a question that I ask people sometimes, you know, um, what do you do when you're stressed? Oh, well, you know, you know, it really helps me when I go for a walk. Well, can we go for a walk? Um, Mm -hmm. You know, can you go for a walk? Can you take a break? Um, Those are, you're doing two things. One is you're helping someone get in touch with the fact that, oh, they have coped with a challenge before and they've gotten through it. And you're putting them in touch with some strategies that may be helpful to them. These are the steps, basically. And you see, if you keep that in your head, that's actually kind of useful. Yeah. Uh, I think that probably addresses these, right? Yeah, it does, definitely. Um, yeah, we've had several several comments and questions that have came through. Um, TJ, do you want to go through this, our scenario, and, and then come back and address some of these? There's some amazing stories that have came through mm-hmm. here. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. In fact, there's there's one, um, I don't know, again, I'm terrible with names, but Josie, I think it is, Josie Evans, yeah, I, I saw cool. your comment, and, and that's, and he, Josie brought something up that was very uh, important to what we're going to 
kind of covered with uh, with Larry. Um, so, you know, just going back and looking at Larry's situation, you know, me um, from a supervisor standpoint, you know, to Larry, there's a there's quite a few things in here that that are going to stand out to me um, early on. You know, when when uh, approaching him, you know, I, um, I think uh, one of the the key things. Uh, that we need to remember when we're approaching folks to just going back to what Dr. Curtay was saying earlier is what were the, what were the uh, four most important words that you said, Dr. Curtay? How are you doing? How are you doing? And so, yeah. you know, how are you doing? Really? How are you doing? You know, like, yeah, yeah. Like, like really, direct, <laughs> yeah, you gotta be direct with them and like really understand because most people are just going to, you know, put it off and say, Oh, I'm, I'm fine or whatever. But, you know, really, how are you doing? Like if you have to follow up with another four words and do that, you know, just to make sure everything's okay. Um, but, you know, getting to, you know, at the point with Larry and then addressing this stuff, I think one of the big obstacles that a lot of folks have is, you know, uh, the fear of asking, you know, like they're intruding or like they're going to, um, you know, like somebody's going to close up whenever you, you ask them, like, how are they doing? Um, there's a few things that I, I took notes on, let me see that, um, uh, that I got from the mental health first aid class uh, with Dr. Curtay, but also through my experience in the, the military as well, we had something similar to this called ACE. It was ask, you know, care and escort. That was our little acronym or whatever we use, but it was followed pretty much the same fundamentals as, um, as algae. Um, but the biggest piece is, you know, ask them how they're doing really like, Hey, Larry, how are you doing today? I've noticed, you know, these things, you know, um, and this is not, this is kind of unusual of you. Is there something going on is, you know, can I help with something? What can I do to, to help, you know, um, or what can we do to help or what can we do to support you? Um, and normally when you approach folks in that's that manner, they, they open up to you and, 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 you know, a lot of times you can come to a conclusion on how you, you know, you're going to manage them moving forward, like how you're going to get them the support, the assistance and things like that. Um, you know, with, with this particular one, uh, as far as Larry, um, you know, I, I think there's a few things we, we need to consider here, and we're going to go into kind of the unknowns on a later slide, but the things that we do know, you know, just being a machine operator, that's heavy into, like, safety procedures and things like that. Like, bad things can happen when you're working around machinery and you're not, you know, if, if you're not... Um, in the right mindset and you just are have a complete disregard for your safety and the safety of others around you, you know, it can turn into a more critical incident. So, you know, again, it goes back to identifying things early and often uh, to address them. 32-year-old um, male, that's a big uh, piece right there that, you know, males by large um, are some of the, uh, you know, they, they just don't seek help, you know. Yeah. Sometimes they'll talk to you about it, but they, they don't, you know, and you'll discuss things with them, but they won't ever follow up or, you know, they'll say, I don't have the time to do that or nobody's going to listen anyway or, you know, a lot of times they're, you know, fear of like, you know, not being promoted was a big thing in the military. If you went and, and got help, that's no longer the case. But, you know, it was, it was a sign of weakness, essentially, you know, if you were trying to get uh, help for, uh, for any mental or behavioral health issues. Um, one of the things I would ask them too is, you know, if it's, if, if, if they are, um, you know, we're having a discussion is, you know, are you, do you have any plans to harm yourself or anybody around you? You know, um, that's a, they'll tell you if they do, you know, and if they don't, then, then they won't. But, you know, that's just something to keep into, keep in mind, um, when you're having these discussions with them, because, um, identifying that is, is a, a big piece, you know, you want to jump on top of that as early as possible and, and just make sure you stay with them throughout, you know, um, throughout your, your conversations. Um, the colleagues whispering about increased absenteeism, you know, that's, that's kind of an indirect thing, you know, like you may notice it. Um, but then when everybody else starts noticing it as well, um, it should really never get to that point. You know, um, if, if you're, you should address that early, if you do see something like that, but, um, but, Again, you know, when everybody else starts noticing it, then, you know, you know, it's kind of gotten out of hand and, and it needs to be uh, addressed immediately. Um, and then the just being distant um, and noticing the hands occasionally trembling, um, you know, that's one of the first things that I've seen with 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 uh, individuals experiencing mental or behavioral health crisis 
um, is they become very distant. You know, they um, they no longer want to, you know, I'm a big hunter, you know, like, hey, I don't, you don't want to go, you know, hunting this weekend? No, I'm, I'm just going to stay home. Or they don't answer your calls, return your texts, things like that. Um, you know, that's a, that's a huge indicator that, you know, something's going on. Um, and that, and again, that's a conversation starter. You know, I've noticed that you've been distant lately and um, you haven't been returning to my, my text messages or my emails. You know, when you get on calls, you don't say much when you normally do. Um, you know, what's going on? You know, just have those discussions with them. Um, some of the other things you can do, too, is, you know, when you're addressing these things is if you don't want to do it in front of everybody else, take them for a walk. You know, take them to lunch or do something away, you know, in a place that's safe for both of you all to have these conversations where, you know, that you both feel comfortable um, and, and much more so the person dealing with it, you know, you want to make them as comfortable as possible um, just so they know that you're listening, you know, active listening is a, mm -hmm. a key piece to this, you know, just, you know, not just speaking over them and, and making recommendations, but trying to understand what is really going on and, um, and what it is that you can do to help or, or maybe your EAP resources can help or somebody else might be able to help with. Um, that's how I would approach the situation. Um, and, and I wouldn't let off the gas either. You know, I, you know, Hey, here's my number. If you need to call me after hours and talk through something, call me, you know, if you're having problems at home, like I'm that type of person, you know, if somebody's, you know, not everybody's like this, but you know, me personally, if somebody's going through some things and they really need help, I'm going to do whatever I can to, to help them get on the right path. And if they're, you know, if there's something at home troubling them, you know, and or I, they, they feel like they can't be alone, then, you know, I'm going to try to spend as much time with them as I can uh, just to get them on the right path or, or get them, you know, to somebody that can help them. You know, there's a lot of resources out there that uh, that we fail to use on a daily basis. I mean, hotlines and EAP resources and uh, county and state, you know, resources that we can use. So, um, you know. Utilizing those are, are very important and, and just, you know, knowing when to utilize them is important, like pointing them in that direction. Like, hey, did you know you could do this? You know, it's anonymous. You can call somebody and talk to them. They're there to listen to you. They're there to talk to you. We've got um, our, in fact, our um, uh, Axiom has uh, our Tempo Live um, services and, you know, uh, our behavioral health nurses are great at doing that. You know, they're good at listening just kind of understanding and having thoughtful, you know, conversations with you and not only, you know, being there to talk to you and support you, but um, kind of give you something else to focus on, you know, like your well-being and your health. And so, um, you know, I, I think that's what I would do, I, you know, just seeing this, but the unknown piece, you know, here we are on this slide and, um, you know, depends on pain medication, you do a prior injury and pressure to perform, you know, the pain medication, you know, a lot of times when you see tremors in folks, you know, with hand tremors and things like that, they're having DTs and things, you know, maybe alcohol withdrawal or some kind of withdrawal from uh, substance use or substance abuse. Um, you know, in this particular instance, uh, you know, Larry had a um, an, an injury that was out of work. You know, it was a, you know, I guess he got into a car accident or something, you know, on his private life and had injury and, and they put him on pain medication. Now he's dependent on them, you know, mm -hmm. uh, as a leader, I, I would, you know, if I'm sure Larry would tell me, Hey, I wrecked my car, you know, you know, things like that, you would know, um, yeah. just be able to support them throughout that, that process, you know, and if, if, uh, you know, just checking out, I'm like, Hey, how's your, I heard you hurt your back during your, in your car wreck, you know, how's your back doing? You know, a lot of times when people mm -hmm. tell you, you know, like, oh, I'm doing fine. You know, they gave me medication and this and that you're not trying to get into their personal lives or intrude in their personal lives, but you want to know these things so you can understand what it is that's affecting them and where, you know, the, the pinch points that you can kind of help them with uh, in the long run. And then the pressure to perform, you know, um, we talked about a little bit earlier, um, you know, again, once a model punctuality, a mentor to those around them, champion of safety, you know, just killing it at work. Um, maybe he needs to take some time off, you know? Yeah, good point, good <laughs> when's point. Time, when's the last time as a, yeah, exactly. When's the last time as a leader that you told or, or you know, 
that you told any of your employees, hey, you need to take a, a week off today, you know. <laughs> well, when's the last time as a leader that you took a yeah. week off? Good point. Excellent <laughs> point. Yeah. 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 You're absolutely right. You know, and yeah. Um, yeah. One, of the, one of the things I encourage my team to do is like they're, you know, they're, sometimes they can be terrible at taking PTO. Um, yeah. I monitor that. I'm like, if, you know, y'all need to be taking at least a week, a quarter, you know, just you've got the hours, like use it, you know. Um, yeah. If I need to fill in for you, or if there's something, like it's not the end of the world. I can help you. You know, <laughs> let's help each other. You know, take some time. Dr. Kurt, did you have any things you wanted to add to any of that? No, I, I yeah. One really quick thing is that um, I, I don't think we we want to leave people with the impression that if someone says they're okay that we're going to keep pressing them necessarily. We want, what we want to do, I think, is make ourselves available. And mm -hmm. we're asking the question. We're not assuming that we know the answer, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, it, and frankly, it's enough to just have asked the question sometimes and let people know that, that you're there if they do want to talk about it. Um, yeah. You know, I think that's important. Um, okay. There have been some great yeah. comments here. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's go through some of these because I think that they they really relate to to especially when we're talking about next steps and and I wanted to go through some of these especially there were some scenarios and some questions um, from both of you, but one that that stuck out in the beginning. Let's see, um, Jim was saying, uh, um, talking about getting mental health first aid. Josie, I was going to come back to your comment. They were talking about, um, you had asked about, said that you work in the oil and gas industry and were asking about how is it that you can speak with men that, you know, feel like that they they can't talk. They don't want to take poise. They don't want to take pills because then they would feel like that they're a zombie, you know. And so you were asking about some other methods um, that you could do to support these employees, this tough man um, image that that sometimes people have that they need help, but they don't want to feel like they're feeling week. Um, Dr. Curte, did you have anything that, that uh, you'd want to share there with Josie? Boy, it, you know, it's a tough one that, you know, interestingly enough, when we have presented in the oil and gas industry, when we've prevent, pre presented to some of these tough, you know, the tough guys who don't want to talk, yeah, I am stunned by the number of people who don't ask questions in the group but who come up and say something to me afterwards. Good point, good point. Um, I think it's important to just create the opportunity mm -hmm. and and do it in plain as plain a language as we can. Um, this is also a place where encouraging self-help and support strategies, you know, like asking people, hey, hey listen, you, you know, we've been under a lot of pressure lately. What, what are you doing to take care of yourself? Um, if the answer is, you know, oh, I, I pound back a six pack every night, well, maybe that's not the best coping strategy, um, right? I mean, there are ways to have those conversations. Um, it, I mean, it, it, we could do a whole other webinar on, on, this, on, on this one, but it's, I, I, think, I think it's important not to make the assumption that guys won't talk. Good point, um, yeah. You know, because sure. often they will. You, you bet. Um, one other question. I know we're kind of running out of time here, but um, Whitney had asked a really good one that said, how do you balance checking in with people when there's HR issues that are being investigated? And I thought that was an excellent point. Yeah, I, 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 I actually kind of highlighted that for myself yeah. as well, because I think it's really important. I think there's two answers to that. What we're talking about is asking questions of, to get at how are people doing interpersonally that might be impacting um, what they're doing. HR issues should be about performance. Mm -hmm. And they're, and maybe they're informing one another. I mean, maybe the fact that I know that, you know, um, TJ, I'm going to pick on you. You know, I, I know that TJ's, you know, haven't, haven't, you know, if he's having arguments with his wife, he's been drinking a little heavy, and he's showing up late, but showing up late has become an HR issue. Right. Right. Well, I want to address the HR issue. Like, dude, you got to get here on time. 
Like, mm-hmm. it's really important to, you know, and that, and we're going to address that, you know, and I also know that you're going through a lot. So maybe there are some resources that we can point you towards to get help. I, yeah. I'm probably not going to be the person to do both of those interventions, but I'm going to acknowledge them. Right. Um, you know, I, the other way that this comes up and I, uh, uh, again, I'm conscious of time, but the other way that this comes up is I often used to tell people, listen, the mo- the best predictor of somebody returning to work from a leave of absence is did their boss call them? Oh, um, good point. Excellent. And say how they're doing. But I'd often hear, um, uh, but, I, but I would often hear, um, well, I can't call them and ask them that question because it's, you know, that's HR inappropriate. Right. Mm-hmm. I'm not talking about calling somebody up and asking them how when their next doctor's appointment is or what the doctor said. I'm talking about calling people up and saying, how are you doing? Yep. I'm thinking about and, you. Yeah. You know, and meaning it. Right. Yeah. So there are, I think we have to be conscious that there are two separate issues here. One is about strictly about performance and the other is about human contact. Um, and granted, there's overlap. Uh, yeah. That's all. Yeah. Um, One last question that just came in. Um, Let me ask you this real quick before we go. Um, Kathy was saying, do you think that when someone doesn't want to speak with anyone um, and you know that they're struggling, does that mean that they're more likely to commit suicide? Um, Yes. And I mean, yes, I'm more concerned, but no, not necessarily. It's not by itself a risk factor. But if I have that question in my mind, this is one of the hardest things to teach people in mental health first aid is ask the question directly. Yes. Right? Yes. We have this notion that if we ask somebody if they're thinking about killing themselves, um, that we're going to put an idea in their head. And it just doesn't happen like that. Like. Nobody said nobody says in response to are you thinking about harming yourself? Are you thinking about killing yourself? Nobody like slaps themselves in the forehead and said no, but what a great idea. If yeah. somebody is thinking about it, it's a relief because now I get to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If they're not thinking about it, they're going to look at you like you have two heads and say, no, why would you think that? <laughs> Good right? point. Good point. Uh, that's a really important thing to, yes. to be aware of. But so that's my answer to that question is if you're worried yeah. about that, ask. Ask. Mm-hmm. Good point. Guys, these are such good questions. We're going to follow up with you individually. Um, you'll be getting something from me. I also encourage you, if you haven't done, done it already, to sign up for the next event because we're going to continue to be going through um, some of these conversations. They all kind of tie in together. And so, like I said, this is a three-part series, so we're going to be continuing this through the quarter. So thank you again for attending. You guys have been an amazing audience, and we appreciate all of your stories, um, and we look forward to seeing you then in the event in May. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody.